Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. When Frank said it was a great pleasure to introduce me there, I wasn't able to assess his sincerity because I was standing behind him. <laughs> uh, so I couldn't quite catch the, the body language. Uh, but, of course, there are many circumstances in which it is important to be able to decide whether a person is trying to deceive you. Uh, you're a policeman interviewing uh, a, a suspect. You're a member of a jury trying to evaluate uh, the guilt of, of a, a person on trial. You're a politician and want to know what <laughs> your opponents might have in, in mind for you. And, uh, of course, when Neville Chamberlain met uh, Adolf Hitler back in the late 1930s, uh, he was interested to know uh, whether he had any ambitions to expand his territories. And he was uh, reassured that this was not the case. He came away saying that I got the impression that this was a man who could be trusted to keep his word once he had been <laughs> given it. Uh, a rather... Um, bad failure of, of lie detection with rather um, tragic consequences. So there are lies, big and small. Most of us admit to lying two or three day, uh, times a day on average, but most of those are fairly harmless little white lies that are intended to sort of oil the social cogs. And uh, there were a couple of films that illustrate uh, how important it is to be able to lie. One was called uh, The Invention of Lying, the Ricky Gervais film, and the other was Liar Liar with Jim Carrey, in which it becomes very clear that if you are incapable of, of lying, you are at a serious disadvantage socially. But the lies that we're most concerned about are, are those with major impact, uh, particularly in uh, the areas of uh, murder, uh, terrorism, and uh, perhaps, uh, as in the case of, of Adolf Hitler, uh, high-level politics. You might call that high-stakes lying, and it tends to follow different rules from the little everyday white lies. I'm sure you all know that if your partner says, does my bum look big in this? <laughs> uh, you know what the correct response ought to be, regardless of the truth. <laughs> now, in medieval times, they had a, a very cunning way of um, establishing whether a woman who was uh, denying witchcraft, consorting with the devil, was telling you the truth or not. You would throw her in the water, and because nobody much in those days could swim, uh, a witch would be able to swim because she uh, had special powers uh, assigned by Satan. Um, if she was innocent, she would drown. So one way or another, you, you disposed of the matter. And uh, it's excellent logic to that. They, they use it in waterboarding suspects at Guantanamo, Guantanamo as well. Um, if, uh, if you are innocent, you... Um, you might well drown, <laughs> or at least undergo a very uh, unpleasant experience. Um, if you confess, then uh, chances are it, um, it's a useless confession anyway, because uh, it would have to be externally validated, because uh, people who confess under coercion and torture might be telling you anything just to stop that procedure. The best known uh, lie detector is, of course, the polygraph, which um, measures various uh, indicators of stress or emotional arousal, things like skin conductance, heart rate, uh, respiration, blood pressure, and, and finger temperature. It's been around for a very long time. Uh, the Scientologists use something similar. They call it an e-meter. It's a very crude measure of skin conductance. Uh, which may frighten you into giving them some information that uh, they might be able to use against you should you wish to uh, absent yourself from the, the cult further down the line. Uh, now, the polygraph is, um, is not 100% reliable. And it all depends, really, on how you use it. Um, 
you have to have some kind of control for uh, responses to a situation in which um, you will be nervous and uh, emotionally aroused just because of, of the situation that you're in. You might be afraid that you are going to be incorrectly identified as lying, for example. So what you need are control questions where the interviewer or interrogator knows which are true and false answers as a baseline for comparison for the critical questions. Uh, the paradigm that they call guilty knowledge is perhaps the most um, valid of them all, in which um, you are, after a few preliminaries, you are watching for reactions to items that an innocent person would find totally innocuous, but which would be very arousing to uh, a suspect should he be guilty. Um, for, a bit like the old um, game of, uh, of detecting murder. It's a parlour game, isn't it, where the murder is committed in the the kitchen, the bathroom, the living room, or the hall or something. So uh, if you know uh, where the murder was committed, and uh, only a guilty suspect would know that, then you would uh, perhaps put those various locations to that individual and uh, expect to see a heightened reaction to the location of the actual murder, or different implements of killing, for example, a knife, a gun, uh, strangulation or whatever, if uh, the person you're interviewing, you, you are interviewing, should not know uh, the method of the killing, then uh, if they give a, a heightened reaction to the critical item, uh, then that would count against them. But still, um, lie detectors are not reliable enough to be accepted in our courtrooms, although they have been found quite useful in prompting some people to confess. And uh, as, as I say, a confession is not actually good evidence against anybody. You would have to back that up. Uh, you would have to confirm the details of that um, confession externally to take it seriously. You'd be amazed at how many people confess who are not guilty of, of particular crimes. The idea of a truth serum has been around for a long time and various um, hypnotics like uh, sodium pentothal, psychedelics like LSD have been tried. Uh, none of them are very much good because while they get the person talking, uh, you don't, they're not necessarily talking any kind of sense. Much of it is fantasy. Um, you get too much information and you have no way of knowing whether it's valid or not. Um, apart from that, it's probably unethical uh, and illegal in most uh, Western societies anyway. Um, there is a suggestion that uh, truth serums might make a, a comeback at some time in the future. Um, in particular, oxytocin, uh, which is a, a, a sort of a, sometimes called the cuddle hormone, it will make people more trustful of others. And it's been suggested that it might be useful in facilitating the, the so-called good cop bonding. If the policeman uh, is getting on side, look, you know, I can help you. All you have to do is tell me the truth and, uh, and everything will be all right. Uh, it, it might be useful uh, as a persuasive procedure in that kind of context. Whether that's ethical or not, I don't know, but it's um, possibly more ethical than torture, anyway. <laughs> now, how easy is it uh, to spot liars and is there individual variation in that skill? Untrained observers turn out to be about 53% accurate in detecting lying from body language, uh, which is just marginally better than chance. Most of the so-called experts are little better than that, although apparently there are one or two who are particularly good. And uh, they're the ones that are worth studying because they have, seem to have special talent for the job. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, training uh, people in detecting lies doesn't necessarily help 
It just makes them more uh, confident in their ability to do so, but it's a confidence that is likely to be misplaced. One thing that has been discovered is that experienced liars are, the, are better at detecting other liars than people who uh, are not into deception themselves, in case of it takes one to know one. There's a great deal more variation in lying skill than in the ability to detect lies. And uh, certain traits have been observed in people who are effective liars. A personality uh, attribute called Machiavellianism, tendency to be able to charm and manipulate people to your own ends. Self-monitoring is observing yourself uh, as though you are standing out there looking back, being aware of the signals that you are giving off. Uh, which is a little bit like the technical acting skill as um, espoused by people like Laurence Olivier. Uh, and it's interesting that good liars do tend to be actors or good actors. Uh, they may succeed partly because they uh, lack any kind of emotional feelings that might give them away guilt or anxiety or very often absent from uh, the people who make good liars, or they may have come to believe the, the lies that they're telling themselves. They've come to believe that it's true. Uh, or they may have um, used a kind of self-hypnosis procedure to, uh, to obtain that um, feeling within themselves, rather like uh, the method acting approach, which is to um, persuade yourself that you are really... Uh, in this situation that you are depicting uh, and that um, the feelings the, that you have are real. Now, a rather interesting finding here is that um, psychopaths do tend to be persuasive on, with uh, parole boards. They are about twice as likely uh, than non-psychopathic uh, comparison groups to be uh, granted parole. Uh, while at the same time, of course, they are a, a much greater risk uh, to the rest of the population. They are uh, at greater risk of um, recidivism, for example. Um, <laughs> different uh, attributes of faces come across as more or less trustworthy. And uh, the, the general rule, I suppose, is that if you have a feminine baby face, that's likely to be seen as more trustworthy than the sort of the macho, swarthy, bushy eyebrowed, uh, strong chinned kind of uh, masculine look. Um, that's quite interesting that apparently. Um, Gordon Brown came across as having a less trustworthy face overall than either uh, Cameron or Nick Clegg at, uh, at the last election. Um, but um, within Gordon Brown himself, it is possible to manipulate his picture so as to make him look more or less trustworthy. That's the more trustworthy one. And that's the, <laughs> the even less trustworthy Gordon, Gordon Brown with the sort of the knitted eyebrows, the big chin and swarthy face and, and a, a sort of an angry look. That's the other thing that, uh, that makes you look trustworthy is to smile and look happy. Uh, whereas untrustworthy people tend to look sort of angry. Now, of course, um, whether you have this natural kind of trustworthy look or not will uh, affect jury decisions quite powerfully, and the sentence that you will get if you are found guilty. That's what the, the social psychology research shows. Um, and you, for the most part, it's unfair, of course, that that should be the case. Maybe the uh, juries and judges shouldn't be allowed to see the, the prisoner in the dock. But uh, against that is the finding that the stereotypes are not entirely unfounded. There is an element of truth in stereotypes generally, and this one in, in particular. 
that people with the feminine baby face are actually more trustworthy on average than, than people with the more macho looks. Now, some of the gestures uh, that may be a clue to lying. What is called an illustrator is where you're doing things like, the, the fish, fish I caught was that big. Um, and uh, you might suppose that, that people who use a lot of gestures are trying to reinforce a lie, but in fact the research shows that when people are lying, they tend to reduce the number of illustrative gestures of that kind. So um, deception goes with a decrease in these illustrator gestures. Um, the reason seems to be that uh, many of those gestures are unconscious. They are reinforcing what is being said by adding a degree of uh, emotional involvement or commitment to it. And uh, provided that they are consistent with what is being said, then they will indeed uh, come across as increasing the apparent sincerity. But the reason that um, deception goes with a decrease in illustrators is probably because uh, people who are afraid of being caught lying are afraid to make any kind of gestures for fear that it is some kind of giveaway. And they end up by keeping their hands and their feet and everything very, very stu still. It's called over-control of their body language. It might be a secondary thing because there is so much publicity being given to uh, the diagnosis of lying through body language that people are um, a, a little bit uh, aware of that possibility and hence will minimise body language that might be the giveaway. Uh, whether that applies to all kinds of lying, the small lies and the big lies, um, high stakes lying, is not yet very clear because unfortunately a lot of the research is done with um, students who are told on one occasion to tell a story about themselves that is not true and they are compared with others who are telling a true story and uh, people are looking at the, the body language cues that will discriminate those two groups. And that may not be the same as the situation where your life uh, depends upon being effectively deceptive. The concept of micro-expressions. Uh, these are fleeting little emotional expressions that uh, you may only detect by um, slowing down uh, a video because they, they might be so fast that you see them on only one or two frames. But um, this uh, psychologist, Paul Ekman, a Californian psychologist, has been uh, researching for a long time on the facial ex uh, expressions that um, are characteristic of different emotions, uh, following up uh, the work of Charles Darwin, who actually wrote a book about this whole topic back in uh, about 1890. Um, and uh, Ekman's work, of course, is the basis of uh, the TV series called Lie to Me, in which um, a psychologist who is an expert on body language called Dr. Kel Lightman uh, reads the body language of suspects uh, for the law enforcement agencies, and he's very good at it. Uh, that's what anger looks like according to Paul Ekman. He's analysed the, the muscle groups that are involved in shaping the face so as to make it look angry. So the eyebrows tend to be down and together, close together at the top. The eyes are glaring and there is narrowing of the lips, three of the big cues as to anger. Uh, now there's, there's no doubt about Ekman's work in identifying the, the elemental emotions and what facial muscle groups are um, determining those. The, the idea of um, micro-expressions as, uh, as a cue to lying does lack empirical ver uh, validation in one respect, which is that nobody has really thoroughly studied the, um, the false positives. That is, um, fleeting ex expressions on a person's face that mean nothing whatsoever. 
because most of the work has been done on established liars looking for clues to the, uh, to the fact that they were lying. Um, Ekman himself actually cites um, this chap, Cato Kaolin, who was um, charming the prosecutor in the O.J. Simpson trial because he lived in a, in a shack out the back of Simpson's house. He was uh, giving testimony in support of O.J. Simpson. Um, and uh, Ekman, you can find it on YouTube, as a matter of fact, um, Ekman slows down Cato Kaolin's expressions, and although he is apparently being extremely nice to that prosecutor lady, there are fleeting signs of disgust and anger that creep into his testimony. And uh, I'm not sure if uh, Ekman actually goes as far as to say that he was lying, but, uh, but Kaolin himself kind of admitted uh, sometime after the trial that um, he did think Simpson was guilty and was just uh, sticking up for his mate who'd given him a place to stay in his back garden. Um, there are our experiments which do support the idea of microexpressions. For example, if uh, people are asked to curtail smiling and brow movements during true and false testimonies, those who are giving the false account find it more difficult to contain their facial expressions. Um, and there are other studies in which people are required to, um, to think one thing, feel one thing, and project the, the wrong uh, facial expressions on the other. And uh, again, they, they find it extremely difficult to do that, to be feeling one emotion and displaying another. Um, a famous case, is Kim, Kim Philby was interviewed because it was suspected that he was the so-called third man, a Russian spy. A couple of his mates had defected to Russia and uh, Philby was still there. They thought he might have been the so-called third man and he was interviewed about this. And he couldn't resist a little grimace from time to time, which is a smile that you might interpret as meaning, well, isn't this hilarious? Me standing here denying uh, being the third man in a BBC interview when, in fact, I really am, you know, how I kind of got one over them. It was, it was that kind of a smile. And again, you can see that on YouTube if you, if you want. The other uh, famous um, British case, of course, is um, Tracy Andrews, who um, stabbed her fiancé to death in a remote lane in Kent somewhere after a f they'd been to a pub and got into a fight. <laughs> Uh, and um, she came up with the story that he was the victim of a road rage attack. And uh, she made television appearances appealing for people who might have seen the, the culprits or their car or something that might have information that would be useful in tracing them. Uh, and for the most part, um, she was crying and in terrible distress. Uh, as uh, a, a girl who, whose fiancé had been murdered. Um, but then from time to time there were flashes of anger that, that intruded. And <laughs> this is one, a frozen moment which seems entirely incompatibility, uh, incompatible with um, uh, a young girl who's, um, who is feeling grief-stricken. and sort of gave a clue as to what she might have been capable of. She was, of course, ultimately convicted of his murder. Now, Ekman's work, amongst other people, have shown that uh, when you really feel an emotion, it produces a slightly different spatial uh, expression from one in which you are asked to contrive or manufacture that expression. The spontaneous smile, for example, uh, is slightly different from uh, a faked smile. A lot of it is to do with uh, wrinkling around the eyes, that um, a faked smile tends to be more prominent in the mouth than around the eyes. Um, 
And it also tends to be asymmetrical. It's not very obvious in, in this particular individual. Uh, but it, showing the lower teeth uh, is, a, is characteristic of a faked smile. And um, negative emotions like anger or disgust sneaking through. And I think you could probably detect that there, including the, the furrowing of the, the brows are just a little bit too close together, implying a degree of anger. You know who this is, don't you? <laughs> yeah, Charlie Sheen. Uh, he's, I think he was in trouble for beating up his girlfriend and he has problems of addiction from time to time. Um, great pity because he's a very talented uh, actor. Um, but w skilled actors generally can smile convincingly. I mean, he, Charlie Sheen hasn't quite made it on <laughs> this occasion, but, um, but some actors, again, those uh, trained in the so-called method, do seem to be able to um, smile effectively by conjuring the memory of, of some happy occasion and uh, letting that drive their expression. Now, there's a very popular idea that liars avert their eyes in conversation. They can't look you in the eye. Uh, it's um, not a very reliable indicator now, if it ever was, because, of course, people uh, can be aware of that possibility of giving themselves away and they override it and stare you straight in the face as they're telling you the lie, a bare-faced lie. Um, the sort of pseudoscience called neuro-linguistic programming uh, claims that eye movements can betray lying in that looking up to the left indicates that you are genuinely accessing the memory section of your brain, whereas um, looking upwards to the right is accessing the creative brain uh, and that it is because you are making up the story <laughs> as you go. And it's a good story and it, um, it's quite a popular idea. Unfortunately, it's not true. There's no uh, empirical efforts to uh, verify it have failed. Um, it is not supported by any scientific evidence. What is more promising is something called computerized eye tracking. And this is an eye tracking device here. If it's being analyzed by computer, it can follow uh, the patterns that uh, your eyes are moving in. And it is not a question of, of which way you're looking or uh, whether you're avoiding eye contact or anything. It is a question of whether you change your uh, eye tracking patterns while telling the lie as compared with your own baseline, which has to be... Um, assessed uh, in relation to neutral questions in conversation. If it changes um, in any way at all significantly, uh, then that is more likely to indicate lying. In fact, it's reported as being about 82% accurate, which is not a bad score. And obviously, it's not perfect. None of these things are. But that one is certainly better than the, the simple idea that liars will avert their eyes or they will turn their eyes up to the right. Now, of course, there are all kinds of uh, signs of the body language of stress, which you don't need a polygraph to detect. Sweating and uh, blushing, blinking, dry mouth, uh, such that you might feel compelled to take a glass of water at greater frequency. And um, they oops, oops. <laughs> making little errors of one sort or another, clumsiness, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, unfortunately, they, they're not good indicators of lying because uh, there are many other reasons why you might be feeling stressed, particularly during a public speaking occasion. <laughs> or uh, if you're under an interrogation by the police. Uh, so they are certainly not sufficient uh, indictment in themselves. As a matter of fact, that's a general rule about uh, 
the body language of, of lying, is that um, while there are certain indicators, you have to dispel all the alternative explanations first, really. You've got to consider that there are a lot of possibilities and lying is only one of them. Same is true for the, the self-comforting gestures. Touching the face and so on is, is quite a popular belief that that's an indicator of lying. It's just a stress indicator, really. And the blink rate, there are as many studies that um, show that blink rate is reduced in high stakes lying than increased. So again, you know, uh, Dr. Kel Lightman might be looking for an increase in the blink rate and so on, when in fact the reverse is more likely to be a valid indicator. But as Cal Lightman will tell you, that uh, sometimes the absence of appropriate distress cues in the face might be more of a giveaway. If a person is supposedly grieving uh, a lost spouse or something, if they are not showing the signals of distress, then you might have uh, cause to be suspicious. Lip swallowing, that sort of sucking your lips inwards, uh, tends to accompany thinking and uncertainty, especially when the outcome might be bad. But lip compression that you're seeing here, what you might say, describe as buttoning the lip, uh, is an indicator of lying, and possibly because it's a little bit psychoanalytic, but the idea is that it might represent uh, a need to control the possibility that you will burst out with something that you would much prefer people did not know. Um, in much the same way as a child will put their hand over their mouth. It's, I must not say uh, what the truth is because I'll be in terrible trouble. <laughs> the so-called Pinocchio effect is that, uh, according to, to these uh, American psychiatrists, Hirsch and Wolf, um, the nose contains erectile tissue. It may be uh, something to do with the defense system against um, viruses and carried in the air, um, but um, it does tend to become engorged with psychological stress as well as physical stress. And they did a study in which uh, they looked at the, the tapes of Bill Clinton denying having sex with Monica Lewinsky and observed that he tended to touch his nose uh, more frequently at, at times that were later discovered to, uh, to be um, untruths. Um, it's an interesting thing. Actually, I, I looked into um, the web to, to find a a picture of Clinton touching his nose during the Lewinsky uh, episode, and it, it just doesn't exist. I'm, I'm, I don't know where the researchers found it. I have to take their word for it, but I'm, I'm wondering if uh, Bill Clinton's people have somehow managed to ex <laughs> expunge all images that might be used to illustrate this point, because it's become such a, a popular idea. Voice stress analysis. There are various applications for your phone and computer that will supposedly detect people lying through tiny little tremors in their voice and perhaps a higher pitch than usual. And unfortunately, it would be great if it worked because you could tell when somebody's lying to you down the telephone or on a tape-recorded interviews could be analysed for voice stress later. Uh, here's an illustration of one such system. That's the actual frequency of the voice, and, and this is the analysis of, of the stress you know, in parallel with it. Um, unfortunately, it, it does not come out very well in the um, empirical research which tries to validate it. For example, they will look at voice stress uh, in drug users denying the charge of taking drugs, and compare it with a urine analysis of whether they had actually been taking performance-enhancing drugs or, or indeed any other recreational drugs as well. 
and um, they tend to show voice stress as having uh, no validity at all. It's little better than chance in detecting people lying about the use of drugs. At best, it will detect stress rather than lying specifically. And, uh, but however, like the polygraph, it, it might just prompt a confession in, in somebody that uh, they uh, need not otherwise have offered. Now here's a technology that um, thermal imaging, which has been around uh, at airports to detect fever, you know, in the days of the bird flu, if you go through Singapore airport or something, they will have cameras on you and if they decide that you've got this dreaded bird flu, they probably wouldn't let you on the plane. Um, and there have been attempts to see whether it would be useful to the customs and immigration people to uh, detect uh, false stories in the people that are coming through. The particular study that uh, I'm referring to had um, volunteers who would go through an immigration point and they would, some would give uh, a lying story about what their intention was as they came into the country and others would be telling the truth. And the question is, uh, could they tell them apart? And uh, the answer is, is yes. There's a tendency to heat up uh, around the, below the eyes, each side of the nose here. There's the nose, and the eyes are in there somewhere. And this area just around the eyes tends to get hotter uh, in people who are lying compared with their situation before they went through. People telling the truth showed no change in the temperature of the face in that particular area. Um, and it was found that they could diagnose about, correctly diagnose about two-thirds of the uh, experimental subjects. However, uh, at the same time, the interviewers were doing uh, judgments, just impressionistic judgments of whether people were lying or telling the truth. And they were right uh, about three quarters of the time. So, uh, and, and more than that, the thermal imaging was not adding any uh, predictive power to the, um, to the judges or interviewers' judgments. So you're left thinking that it's not a very useful technology at the moment. It might develop further. Uh, it does have one advantage over the, um, the interviewer judgments, of course, which is that it can be totally automated. You can have this camera sort of uh, on people's faces as they come through immigration or customs, and uh, it can be signalling uh, to the, the interviewer that maybe this is somebody that needs a, a further grilling. Now, of course, lies originate in the brain. So the, the polygraph is working on peripheral physiology, but um, there is the possibility that you might get closer to the source of the lie with brain imagery. And the theory is that if you're telling a lie, you simply have to access memory, which might be in the parietal lobe area. Uh, but if you, if you are lying, the, the task is a great deal more complicated. You've got to first of all suppress the truth and then you've got to conjure something, uh, an imaginary scenario uh, that you're going to tell. And hence the idea, the theory is that the lying will engage the frontal lobes of the brain more. And uh, claims of about 90% accuracy have been made for, the, for this approach. Here's one particular experiment showing that the red is the area that is more active in the liars than the truth tellers and vice versa for the blue. And you can see that it's the frontal areas of the brain which give away, activation there gives away the uh, deception. Uh, but um, again, it, it has not been widely adopted as a lie detection technique for a number of reasons. One is it's extremely expensive, it's extremely cumbersome, 
uh, you'd need a very good reason to stick somebody in an fMRI scanner. And uh, it's also been found that it's not totally immune to cheating. By the same procedure that the polygraph can be beaten, which is to self-stimulate during the neutral condition. That is, think of something horrible, uh, like shooting your girlfriend through a bathroom door or, or, or something at the, at the time that they are presenting neutral stimuli to you. So uh, it may not be as immune to cheating as the original proponents might have hoped. Now there is, uh, most courtrooms uh, do not accept any of these lie detection procedures as a valid form of evidence, but um, India has proved to be an exception. There was uh, this case in a, a Mumbai courtroom back in 2008 in which this couple uh, were convicted of conspiring to poison her fiancé get him out of the way by slipping arsenic into his McDonald's. Um, and uh, she consented to have her EEG recorded. They were looking at a particular uh, evoked response, which is called the P300. Uh, it is a, a positive potential occurring 300 milliseconds after the, the critical stimulus, about a third of a second later. And uh, if that shows activation to uh, statements or items which only a guilty person would react to, uh, then it might betray lying. And in this instance, the, uh, the court and the judge agreed that it showed what they called experiential knowledge, that, uh, that she was reacting to things that an innocent person would not be expected to show any, an exaggerated response to. Um, I think there must have been other evidence as well, incidentally. I don't think that that was the sole reason for the conviction. At least I wouldn't like to think so. But uh, in any case, these two were convicted. And uh, the only other cases I know where this kind of evidence uh, has been admitted um, are in India so far. Now, uh, there are, going beyond body language, there are many people who believe that it is the things that you say that are more important than the way that you are looking. Your speech patterns tend to change when you're lying. Um, an increase in repetitions, undue emphasis and hesitations, and lots of ums and ers. Uh, liars tend to start their answers a bit later unless they're very well prepared in what they're going to say, in which case it's been observed that they will actually start it too soon. Um, the pace is generally slower, which gives them more time to construct a story. Uh, generally they talk less, so that they give you fewer facts and details that could be cross-checked particularly those that are close to the crime itself. And they usually come across as negative and uncooperative in their testimony. Now, the actual choice of words may also be diagnostic. Um, guilty people tend to use very oblique rather than direct denials. They say things like, I'm trying to tell you the truth. Uh, <laughs> The difficulty is that they, they can't because it, it would be um, rather incriminating. They tend to use tentative words like maybe, I guess, perhaps, sort of avoiding commitment to the story that they're giving. Um, O.J. Simpson, uh, when his uh, ex-wife was first discovered stabbed to death, he went on the run, pursued by um, a whole... <laughs> whole entourage of police cars, and they were having a conversation with him uh, on his mobile phone as he was being chased. And they said, OJ, throw the gun out the window. Nobody needs to get hurt. And he said, I'm the only one who deserves to die, which, of course, um, in retrospect, is a, is a confession. So studying closely what people say 
can tell you quite a bit. Um, Clinton said, I did not, uh, which apparently, that's called an expanded contraction as compared with I didn't do it, I did not do something or other, uh, is a bit like the, uh, the undue emphasis, but it, uh, it apparently indicates that the person uh, is not telling the truth. Did not have sexual relations, as opposed, to, it's rather vague, as opposed to sex with that woman, which is a kind of a distancing procedure, distancing himself from Monica Lewinsky. Uh, another giveaway is that there was a chap who was um, talking about his wife who was missing, and uh, as far as anybody, you know, the authorities knew, she was just missing and might be found later that day. But he starts talking about, oh, she was a wonderful woman, my wife, you know. <laughs> in the past tense. Uh, so that is likely to suggest murder. Um, Michael Jackson was never actually uh, convicted of paedophilia, I don't think, but uh, he sort of tended to pay off his alleged victims before it got to court. But uh, many times he would insist that I would never harm a child, which is again sort of uh, a vague denial. He wouldn't... He'd never say anything like, I would never touch, molest, uh, or um, otherwise interfere with, with a child. Just slightly oblique. And uh, you, you can make your own conclusions. There is a procedure for counting word categories. Certain uh, words occur more often in lying statements. There's less self-referencing. Words like I and me occur less often as though the individual is trying to avoid ownership and responsibility for their behavior. Uh, another thing uh, Simpson said, I think, when he was being chased, he said, uh, one thing you must understand, uh, no connection with this killing. And later on, uh, people put an I back into that. I have no involvement with this killing. Uh, whereas other analysts were saying, no, it is, it is a critical bit of information that he could not put the first person reference uh, into that uh, denial statement. Um, more negative emotion, words like hate, worthless, sad, implying self-loathing come into uh, guilty testimony, and fewer exclusion words, except, but, nor, words which distinguish what they did and did not do. And this procedure, which is fully automated, computer does the counting for you, will be about two-thirds accurate as against 52% for human judges who are just looking at uh, these statements and categorizing them as true and false. And uh, they've done similar studies with um, people who are putting deceptive profiles on online dating sets that you can diagnose later. And uh, the same linguistic analysis will dis discriminate the liars uh, from the truth tellers. <laughs> this is a a system called criteria-based content analysis, which is quite widely used, though it probably more needs further validation. And it works on the principle that true stories contain certain elements which you can check off as criteria. And they include the, a lot of detail, unusual details, superfluous details that are not really relevant to the thrust of the story, uh, a context of time and, and place. They tell you what time things happened and exactly where. Verbatim uh, transcripts of conversation, uh, telling you what somebody, exactly the words that somebody used in saying something to you. Including subjective feelings and emotions occurs in the majority of, of true, or occurs more often in true stories than false ones. Self-depreciation, uh, admission of memory lapses. Now, 
it was just before one o'clock. No, hang on, maybe it was about 12.30. That, that sort of thing actually occurs more often in true stories than false ones and spontaneous corrections. Now, uh, Porter and Tenbrinka reckon that uh, this system is great, it's very promising, but the individual criteria need separate validation. We need to be sure that they're all relevant, uh, not just some. And some may be better than others, in which case you might want a, a weighting formula for evaluating them. And they're also, uh, they suggest that the system might be susceptible to coaching if you've really got a story to tell that you want people to believe. Um, interviewing techniques. Uh, there are skilled questioning approaches that can wrong-foot suspects by loading them cognitively, giving them a mental task that is, is just difficult. Um, one, for example, is to ask them to recall the events in reverse order increases cognitive load and increases the difference between true and false stories. You can chuck in unexpected questions and if they've got a well-prepared story you can throw them by that. You can ask the suspect to sketch the locations of people and things in the room, where was everybody, uh, again it will provide you with material that might be cross-checked later it's also been suggested that um, there is a difference between a perspective which is like a camera held on the shoulder versus uh, an aerial view in the sketch map. I think the suggestion is that the person with the handheld camera is giving you a truer account of, of the events than, uh, than the person with the bird's eye view. Strategic use of evidence means that... Um, you might have some evidence, but you withhold it in the interview uh, just to see what the, in, the suspect is going to say about all this. And then you throw it in later, by which time he might already said something that um, contradicts what you already know. And uh, again, is likely to wrong foot the, the suspect. And as I've said before, coercive me methods, uh, torture for example, are just not ethical, not legal, and nor are they effective. So that's just about it. Uh, there are many well-known methods of lie detection, but they lack reliability, and that includes the polygraph, truth drugs, voice stress, thermal imaging. Uh, they are far from reliable. Uh, although it is possible that they may prompt confession. Now, this fellow. Um, was convicted uh, in 2011 because uh, he took a polygraph uh, about his missing wife. She'd been missing by that time for four years. Uh, he failed the polygraph and uh, confessed. And, of course, as I say, the confession in itself is no use, but he was able to verify the confession by taking police to where he had buried the body. Um, body language indicators are vexed. There are a lot of popular beliefs, a lot of folklore about it, about how liars should give themselves away. They're often wrong, if only because they're so well known that the liar can easily override them. Uh, and the same applies to the new research that I'm giving you tonight. Uh, I could be sabotaging it. Uh, because, uh, you know, anybody intent on lying could use this information to lie more effectively. So uh, it, it is departures from a baseline that is idiosyncratic to the particular suspect that are most telling and most effective. Um, but uh, as I say, that... Uh, that the more we, we know about how to detect liars, the, the better liars we become ourselves. 